Warning. The following contains bright, flashing lights, and slash or imager that may cause discomfort, and slash or seizures for those with photosensitive epilepsy. Viewer discretion is advised. Well, this is episode two of the Manifesto Radio Podcast. I have a very special guest uh, that is here representing a very special organization that I've, uh, that I'm a big fan of, uh, that is doing a lot of important work, I think. Uh, Jeanette, welcome. Thank uh, you. Happy uh, to be here. Awesome. I know it was a trip for you. <laughs> you travel around. You're, you're almost like the same level of hobo as I am, so yeah. like as far as moving around. So, Live out of a backpack all the time. Yeah, that's a great it's life, good. you know? Wrinkly clothes and uh, just wearing the same thing over and over again, looking like yeah. a picture, basically. Just add a blazer to it. Oh, yeah. Just completes the I need, I need to take some notes from you. <laughs> um, Jeanette works for Demolaire. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is the I think this is the first of the podcast appearance that you're, ma you're making or Demolaire is making as far as uh, you it know, is. being out there. Yeah. Uh, so for people that don't know, uh, you know, what Demolair is. Can you explain to us a little bit what, what that project uh, is, is about? Yeah, absolutely. So Demolair started as a social media page with the need to represent Mexico as Mexicans see it and as Mexicans know it. Um, it very rarely makes it out to the international community or at least in a very English-speaking source. And what we wanted to do was bring the nuance to what is happening. You know, I think everybody understands that Mexico is going through something, but that's something they don't really know about or yeah. they can't really put it into words or they can't explain it that well. And what we wanted to do with the Moler was to bring that to you, to explain it in the detail that it deserves, in the manner that we see it, that is it Nobody really covers it. Yeah. So Demolair has been around for how long? It's a. We've been doing this for about two and a half years. Yeah, like I remember, I first I, I first uh, learned about Demolair like on Instagram. Uh, yeah. I started seeing some of the reporting that you, that Demolair was doing, and I was like looking at the details expressed in some of these things. And as somebody that not only I'm Mexican, born in Mexico, but I actually work here in yeah. in, in, in government work during security. Um, I got to I, I got to see like a detailed analysis of things, and I that I recognize. It's not like a like an oversimplification or, or like a, something an outsider would just kind of like mm -hmm. put forth as far as an article for yeah. it. It was like very concise, and also you could see that it was uh, done by people that are Mexican, you know, mm -hmm. that are English speaking and want to convey some of that information for an English English speaking audience. But are very much invested in Mexico. Is mm -hmm. that is that uh, is that a Absolutely. safe to say? Absolutely, and I appreciate you say that because that's exactly what we want to communicate. You know, we we live here. We are seeing what a lot of people experience, and you know, a lot of that voice gets forgotten because you know they're Spanish speaking, or you know, I think we've also gotten into the space where we're so used to it. We're so used to the violence. It's almost become our own pot. You know, our own hot pot that yeah. we're just, we don't feel the boiling anymore. Yeah, you know? our, our normal is very abnormal. Absolutely. Places, you know? uh, having somebody get killed in front of us and then continuing on with our taco eating, you know? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> is, a police chase going in the back, tackling the shit out of somebody. It's nobody, just, nobody ducks. <laughs> they just take off their phones and take some cool ass TikTok videos. Yeah, yeah. It's a very fast rotating cycle. And, you know, I think that adds a little bit to the problem as well. I think that a motive or a reason why we're doing this is because we also want to change the culture. You know, we want to help people to understand that this is not normal. Yeah. That what we are experiencing is something, you know, that I've seen in areas that are classified as war or conflict. Yeah. So we forget that. Yeah. So we before we get too deep into Demolair <laughs> and the mission of Demolair and a lot of the work, the amazing work that Demolair does. Jeanette, how, how did you get to, how did you get there? Like, can, can you tell us a little bit about your story yeah, about, and how you got it, got, got it involved with Demolair? Yeah, it's, it was a while ago. So actually I started in the humanitarian field. Um, no, no, 
like where, where, so so for people that might not know you like where are you from where were you oh. born that that, yeah. that type of thing like that is also it? a very interesting story i was my parents at the opposite i was born in los angeles i was born in the u.s yeah and then a few months after i was born we they lived in south central la okay uh, so the rodney right. king riots happened wow so la native rodney king's era yeah so my parents had migrated from mexico to the u.s you know with the promise of you know prosperity and a better life first year there rodney king riots wow that's that's an that's that's an interesting uh wow that's an upside that's an upside down ex uh, immigrant experience basically yeah okay. and and they left you know as soon as the national guard came in um because you know my sister was 10 years old my little my brother was eight they remember the Molotovs just being thrown. I mean, guns everywhere. It was it traumatized. Yes. With the, with on the, the rifles. Rooftops. Rooftop Koreans. <laughs> Favorite thing about that ride. It's an <laughs> iconic thing about that yeah. ride. And it traumatized them a lot. So then we moved back to the U.S. So I grew up in, in Jalisco. And I I mean, the best childhood I've ever had. So you moved back. Child I've ever had. You moved back to Jalisco after the the riots in LA. Yeah. But this is this is 19 like this mid 90s. Mid 90s Jalisco. It's not what it is today. Oh no. I'm It was not. it was kind of like probably you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't as open as it is today as far as the violence and some of the things oh, going yeah, on down there. Absolutely. So it's it's like I mean, I could idealistic ideal idealized Mexico of the 90s. It was a beautiful era to live in. Um I mean, it was, you know, when they say that a village uh, raises you or takes a village that's what it was i grew up with the neighborhood you know yeah. back of my dad's pickup truck just getting you know rolling around and you know we got to experience a lot as kids you know just running around and, and everybody taking taking care of you 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 crack your head open the uh, abuela across the street patches you up and it's just you know very fluid yeah it's it's, it's old school mexico I mean, jalisco <laughs> is, is yeah, back then specifically, I mean, I could imagine um, safety and just letting your kid go somewhere and come back to the, from the store and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. That was like a, it was, it was still there. Basically. Yeah, it was. Wow. Yeah. So, so yeah, so I was we we stayed there for a while and then my parents wanted to go back. Yeah. And we went back in two thousand one. Okay. And then September eleven happened. So, for me. <laughs> That was my concept of the U.S. You know, every, everything that I heard from my sister saying, oh, we left because of these riots. And then me going back the first year, didn't speak a lick of English, didn't, you know, I didn't really know how to interpret this new world. And then, you know, the big thing happened. And so, then I so, just thought so, that that was America. <laughs> so, so you left, you left uh, the U.S. with the, the riots and then you came back to 9-11 as your reception back into yeah. the u.s the welcome back <sighs> i mean yeah. I, I mean i can imagine that what that, that did to your perception you know yeah as far, it, as, far as what the u.s is you know your, your home country in mm -hmm. a way wow um how old were you when 9 11 happened i was 10. so, so uh wow yeah. that's a, that's a mind-blowing kind of a life experience to have as far as your american experience mm -hmm. um so I think that largely shaped, you know, also like the perception and the understanding of what was going on, you know, and then you grow up hearing that your country's or, you know, your adopted country, Mexico, is, is going through a lot. And I'm like, mm, you guys are. <laughs> yeah. You, the, your perspective was like, ah, no, everything was calm down there. Here. Yeah. Here is, this, is a, this, yeah. Is, this is the scary part. I can imagine that as a kid, yes. how the perception would have been. So you come back to 9-11 basically yeah. and you're 10 what was your youth like in the u.s like uh growing up in the u.s with that kind of behind you like how, it, what, what were you like yeah. teenage teenage years it was different i mean i i think so my first couple of years there i didn't speak english um so a lot of it i spent it just you know being into myself and reserving you know i think it was a very difficult culture also to understand because i had just come from a country that you know, the whole community embraces you. And then we go to another country where you live in your own fence. Yeah, it's a box. Your own quarter. And you don't talk to your neighbors. Your neighbors don't talk to you. You do you. Yeah. And I think that was the most impactful thing because it's like you the, automatically lose a support system. Yeah. Uh, with my experience, I, I migrated to the U.S. 
late into my 30s basically and one of the first things i experienced was that the 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 isolation aspect of mm -hmm. it where you know i know not all of the us is the same but uh, a lot of parts are where it's like this is our house this is our property uh, people don't say good morning good afternoon there is no community aspect to it not like it mm -hmm. is in mexico so yeah, that, it huge. was it, it was it was probably very like it felt very isolating. It was not yeah. just because of the language barrier, but also because of the fact that the communities are just different. you don't have anything anymore, and you have to rebuild it. And you know these are people that also don't understand you, or you feel like they don't understand you. Yeah. And by that virtue, you don't understand them. So I think you know my first couple of years were very isolated, and then of course the rebellion happens and just fuck everything and <laughs> <laughs> go into the we're talking about teenage you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, rebellious. Like I grew up as a punk kid here in, in Tijuana. I, I was I was into punk music. Uh, my rebellion was through skateboarding and defacing public property. You know, that was most of my youth. What was it like for you out there in the United Very States? Very similar, <laughs> defacing <laughs> public property too. Yeah, I actually, uh, uh, I got arrested for uh, it was public. It was tr trespassing and vandalism as a misdemeanor. <laughs> I mean, sorry, mom. <laughs> we, we all we all start somewhere, I guess. Right? Yeah. I mean, all of that, for me, a lot of that uh, risky behavior when you were when you were a kid does build something in you, a character. Mm -hmm. You know, you're a risk taker. I mean, not it might, it might be not something you would advise a kid to do, but you know, uh, dangerous, unsupervised freedom at that age uh, teaches you a lot of lessons. It does. And yeah. uh, stupidity gets corrected quickly. You know. It does. <laughs> and people that don't go through that uh, tend to have some of those issues later on in life when it's really serious, when mm -hmm. you're really into it. That's an interesting... Yeah, an you interesting need to let it out. Yeah. <laughs> I was lucky my record got expunged. <laughs> awesome. Uh, yeah, that's... I think you are very lucky. Yeah. Um, rebellious youth, mm -hmm. punk, defacing public property. Yeah. A few problems probably along the way yeah you feel misunderstood i mean it's it's kind of the narrative for all the youth right you feel like authority is, is somehow impeding you from you know being you and because you know also at that time it was you know the Iraq war and it was yeah. very politicized and and you know i also didn't really understand what was going on you know why why do we hate them and yeah. why do they hate us yeah. you know and this narrative that's formed around it i i found it to be very intriguing yeah and, you know, that also got me to be very interested in other cultures and other, you know, religions and, and other people. And, you know, there's also that resistance to it. It's like, yeah, um, you know. So from that youth, did that give you direction as far as you then saying, you know what? I think I want to know what I do, what, what I want to do with the rest of my life. Like if if your life was a comic book story. Like what was the what was the radioactive spider that bit you basically? Yeah, I think you know my my superhero would have been just a just a stone rolling around collecting moss. <laughs> it's a rolling <laughs> it, stone. Yeah, to be honest, it was you know a lot of that experience was just trying a lot of shit. Yeah, was just getting involved in a lot. Um, you know, I I didn't really want to spend a lot of time at home. And so that just got me involved into anything that I could, sports, clubs, you know, friends, just watching my friends practice band and, or their friend, you know, the band, the garage band. And, you know, through that, I got interested in politics, mainly, mainly hating on politics and, and being good at debating that. Um, so my superhero would have definitely been just you know, talking to people. Also, I was really interested in people's convert, like people's stories. I thought that learning from something from someone was always so intriguing and always complimented something. And learning from their perspective really, you know, helped to inform my perspective. I'm like, oh, I never really thought about it like that. That's yeah. really interesting. Oh, but then tell me about this. And it was just, it always just created an, an, an environment of just wanting to know why. So, so inquisitive. Yeah, just and just wanting to know more. Tell me more and yeah. tell me why. Yeah. Yeah. So you you go you go into this inquisitive, asking questions, doubting things, just being skeptical, annoying, annoying <laughs> just you know, annoying just everyone. Annoying. That's great. Uh, where does that take you in your in your in your you know early years, your twenties? Yeah, where, so, where does that take you? 
So with me not wanting to be at home much, that took me across the country. I went to D.C. to, um, you know, as soon as I got accepted to a university, I just took it. And I was 16, just flew across, didn't really know what I was going to expect. Um, you know, it didn't really have much of... Um, you know, that support network to, to show me the way how. So I, from the very get go, I knew that I had to show myself the way. And it came with a lot of fucking errors and a lot of trials. And, and but, you know, that got me to be very self-sufficient. I felt yeah. it taught me how to just deal with it, survive. And, you know, that complemented also my wanting to explore different areas um, you know, the first time that I got to go abroad, I went to Kenya, um, spent a couple of months there. Um, and wh wh what what uh, gave you the opportunity to go abroad? Um, I saved a shit ton of money and probably did a bunch of things <laughs> I shouldn't have done. Yeah. <laughs> but what, so volunteering. Do, volunteering. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah tra travel is amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, getting, I mean, I think, I think if anything, we as Americans, one of the things that people should do to their youth as far as their kids Absolutely. giving the giving them the experience of travel so they can see how the rest of the world lives would be mm -hmm. I, I would say it's a pretty big on the recommendation oh, absolutely. list now uh so you travel abroad uh you volunteer you you decide to get involved in the world basically mm -hmm. which is not a common thing for the youth to want to kind of do everybody wants to just mm -hmm chill out but you're not no let's let's go see what the world's like yeah so through volunteering earning money on your own being independent mm -hmm. you know just running away basically yeah that is that is my how my superhero <laughs> was developed it just it just you just ran away mm -hmm. uh you got involved with the world um you go to kenya uh, mm -hmm. what was the, what was that like experiencing i mean You've already experienced L.A., you know, Jalisco, you know, you go back to the U.S. Do you ever experience those, those uh, that, that, that type of lifestyle? Kenya is a completely different universe, right? Yeah. So what was that like? Yeah, I mean, it's hard not to go into it with, like, one narrative, right? You Like, when I went to it, you think that, um, like, I, I almost regret saying this, but it is reality. You go into it like, oh, they need to be saved or, you know, they need to be helped. And real fast that thing sh shifts because you realize, no, 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 they're perfectly fine. It, you're here to learn and yeah. you're here to just absorb. And I mean, I worked in two different children's homes. One of them was for destitute children um, whose parents had either passed away from HIV or had abandoned the children who had HIV. And so, you know, automatically you get thrown into a community that you would expect to be suffering. You yeah. know, from the outside, you expect them to be, you know, that, they, that they're the ones that need the support. And you and I went in there and quickly realized it was like, no, they're, they're doing that for me. <laughs> they're helping me. They're helping me realize so much about the world and about life and about you know, how, you know, how your narrative and, and, and your mentality could be sh shifted. Yeah. You know, they were, they were some of the most happiest children that I've ever met. I mean, we would go collect trash bags and roll it up and turn it into a soccer ball. And, you know, that would entertain that, us for hours. That was enough for them to have like a great day. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, and that, that was just a, such a beautiful experience because, you know, if you look at it from like the outside, like from your basically, if you try to superimpose what your concept of normal happiness fulfillment is to a place like that, you are going to do a disservice to them and you. Absolutely, absolutely, that's and a, that's a powerful lesson. Yeah, and you have to also allow yourself to just be really, you know, flexible and and, and loving of the experience. You know, it's going to sh completely shift your mind and yeah. completely shift everything that you know to be kind of true but you have to let it yeah you know that that is a big evolutionary kind of component yeah and so i worked there and then i also worked with another uh children's home for uh children with mental disabilities and it was you know a lot of these children's had been abandoned by you know their caregivers because of the perception of having a mental disability 
And also you go into it with this perception of like, you know, these children need my help. And yeah. quick, very quickly you learn. It's like, no, no, no. They're, they're, <laughs> they're, here to, they're here to show me stuff and just make me chill out, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we grew up or we were there with like, you know, they used to tell me about the ostrich. There used to be an ostrich that came to the front of the house and like we couldn't, you know, they were telling me, it was like, that's really angry. And I'm like, no, oh, it's a bird. <laughs> and then, yeah, it would show up. The ostrich would just show up and it, fucking scary thing normal is a fluid concept oh, yeah normal is a fluid concept it, it, it doesn't travel with you mm -mm. It's, it, that's an interesting lesson yeah absolutely. Uh, volunteer work uh, it's awesome you know t t going out there and knowing what different types of normal is for mm -hmm. other people uh, where does where does the uh you becoming uh somebody that reports on or talks about or writes about some of these things where where does that start mm -hmm. well rolling around some more i ended up um in the middle east i i started studying arabic um and i went to jordan uh in 2010 and that's when you know we started seeing the reverberations of the arab spring yeah that, that, to, to, so 2000 era middle east jordan area that's that's an interesting spicy time yeah very that's a spicy, spicy. <laughs> that's a very spicy time for them you were you were you were around for them yeah wow so i was in jordan and then i had the option to you know go to north africa so either libya or egypt um and then you know we start rolling in 2011 and you know i hear about tunisia and protests in tunisia started happening and we were also witnessing protests in in, in amman and then you know it starts getting a little bit spicier and spicier and spicier until we hit egypt and you know effectively the the arab spring starts yeah and now, 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 what, what were you seeing that would, would indicate that things were happening was it uh the mass protests, mm -hmm. uh, social, were social media being utilized as a weapon. Yeah, absolutely. And, it, and, and, and the, specifically the violence, right? Yeah. There, there were a few incidents that triggered some of this, right? Like, like iconic incidents that, mm -hmm. like, w w like, can you talk about some of that? Yeah, absolutely. In Tunisia, it was kind of noted, noted as a start. Um, uh, a fruit uh, seller basically self-immolated. He set himself on fire after his fruit cart was confiscated by the police. Suddenly that started, um, you know, gre airing grievances of police brutality, of, you know, uh, income inequality, of unemployment. You know, all of these different grievances culminated. Just attached to that single event. Exactly. You know, that kind of that, that straw that broke the, cram broke the, the camel's, camel's back. back. Yeah. And then we started seeing that in Egypt. And, you know, the first protests were for um, a young man who had been taken by the police brutally brutally tortured his body was returned to his parents you know unrecognizable um so the first protest started as ana halit saeed i am halit saeed and you know it was a, started as as the rejection of this police state of this this repressive state um controlled by somebody who had been in power for over 30 years and who was unwilling to relinquish power yeah and we started seeing these calls for protest on facebook you know, suddenly this video popped up of this woman saying, I'm going to go to the Medan, Medan Tahrir, um, the, the roundabout, and I'm going to protest, yeah. join me. And, you know, we didn't really think anything of it. We just thought isolated events. We've seen a few of these happen, but nothing really. And then on January 25th, full. Explosion of that, just everything. Everything. And... You know, it's one of those moments where it completely shifts everything because you know the normal of this country. You have already observed it. You have already experienced it. This is the normal. And then suddenly this happens where people actually start talking po politically, yeah. you know, and, and vocally, yeah. knowing that there's a huge risk. Yeah. Now, now when, you, when you're observing this, and you know, this is coming from somebody, I, that's not my area of expertise, but hearing some of the things coming out of the middle east during that time obviously a lot of foreign influence started like saying well you know what this is an interesting thing that's happening let's get our hands into it mm -hmm. did you did you did you from your perspective there did you notice a lot of that foreign influence uh 
coming into some of this Arab Spring situation and kind of like trying to take ownership and or direct it somehow? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we started seeing, or at least in Egypt, because I spent most of my time there. In Egypt, I started seeing it kind of a few months into it when like the U.S. was like, oh, well, this might not stop. So we shouldn't, you know, we kind of need to say something about it. And then, you know, it first started as, you know, we need to, or at least we interpret it as, you know, we we need to calm down a little bit. Like this is getting a little hairy. And then suddenly, I think when it just the 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 you know the the hill had been crossed, and there was no turning back, we started hearing calls, you know, from Obama saying, "Okay, we you know Mubarak should probably step down." Yeah. So so we started seeing you know a lot of this kind of push for. Basically, you know, they took a side after like they just waited out to the sidelines and then just they took waited a side. Out. Yeah. yeah, that's and an it's interesting. It's like thing. okay, we're just gonna bet for the winning team at this point. <laughs> So, so you, 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 you were there for some of that. That's an, that's a, that's an amazing, that's an interesting experience to have. Specific, and I, and I, and I ask about it specifically the triggers, um, because, you know, a fruit vendor doing that to himself, uh, a, uh, a single individual being tortured by the police and getting handed back in a horrible state to his parents. Those are two events with two individuals. Mm hmm. And now you're working, uh, you know, covering a country where that is every day. Happening every day. And there's thousands of stories of people mm-hmm. like that. And yeah. we don't have a Mexican spring, you know. Yeah. That, 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 that's where I'm going with some of the questions, you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> um, so you, 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 uh, you have that experience out there. Um, what's, what, what happens next mm-hmm. after your experience there? So I think what Egypt exposed me to, and, and so I, I had been working at a humanitarian organization there doing, um, you know, their security portfolio and basically reporting for with or for the organization. Um, you know, my job was to basically assess what was going on and report on trends and, and analyze. And, you know, I working in this, seeing it outside my window and then also hearing what other organizations were covering, primarily who weren't there. <laughs> who were, you know, who had such a massive platform to inform, you know, other governments or people who, you know, wanted to observe or wanted to remain interested in this, you know, it, you start wondering what the motivations are and you start actually being able to prove, have evidence that, you know, this is, you know, this is how it's actually, you know, yeah. I can see it. Yeah. Th- this is this is how it's developing and there doesn't always have to be this significant analytical process to it. We just have to kind of observe it and, you know, be able to, to represent it accurately. And so, you know, some of those first reports that were coming out were, you know, the, the police was just being absolutely brutal. I mean, I was in Tahrir where it was an area of, you know, chanting and singing and people together and children were there with their mothers and you know it was just such a positive state but a few you know a few meters away there was a street called Mohammed Mahmoud which was effectively kind of the front lines of the clashes between the protesters and the police I mean this is the first time that I ever saw a tear gas canister go into someone's head yeah. it was you know the methods that they were using were absolutely brutal and and you know, I think we were still trying to balance the narrative between like, oh, the police versus the, the protesters kind of on an equal, equal platform. But, you know, the, the level of proportionality was just so out of this world. And I felt that, you know, there, you know, I think that drastically informed how nuance and detail is very important when you're covering a space. These voices matter. Yeah. And having someone that is actually there and reporting from there actually matters. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I've taken that concept everywhere that I've gone, you know, and if I'm not able to be there, I at least make a point to talk to people who are there. You yeah. know, you have to include their voices. You have to make them kind of say their own record. You, participate, you have to make them participate in that, uh, that journal entry of the world for that specific part of the world. Absolutely. So you... So you go through that experience, mm-hmm. that insane experience. Um, we met through training, right? Like uh, I remember, 
I have a memory of it every day. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that <laughs> in a bit. Uh, but before that, you reached out through Demolaire about, uh, I remember I saw a very specific post about Demolaire. Now, can you talk about how you uh, how you basically got involved with Demolaire, like how that what that project, uh, you know, what what that project is about? Um, I saw a post of Demolaire, and it was talking about a very like a very specific incident that happened in Mexico. And I'm not a reporter. I, I comment on things that happen in Mexico. I get asked to to comment uh, for a few news news agencies um, on things that happen related to security issues and stuff like that on the border in Mexico. Uh, but when I saw the writing that Demler was doing and how it was keeping everything concise, it didn't seem to have a political slant to it, which is something that is very common in a lot of mm -hmm. news agencies that report on Mexico that are that are U.S. based or are tar or, or, or are focused on the U.S. market. Mm -hmm. And I saw the I saw it. And I was like, that's an interesting that's an interesting uh, platform. So I started sharing some of that stuff. And you reached out, hey, thank you, right? Oh, I mean, you're welcome. Keep mm -hmm. keep at it, right? Uh, and then you showed up to a training. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was that like? Yeah, it was. I mean, I had been following you for quite a while. Um, I had been interested in what you were doing, especially also since you, you know you're you're one of us. Um, yeah. And. <laughs> And, you know, at that time, it's also, you know, doing this kind of work in Mexico gets very complicated. Um, it, it, it gets very touchy. I think uh, I think you should be more clear about it. Uh, being a reporter of any kind in Mexico is probably, and I, 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 you can say this clearer than I can, it is the most dangerous place in the world to be reporting on the news. It's it's officially been classified as, as the most dangerous country in the world to be a reporter. And this is something you're doing, right? So uh, I remember self preservation. Self preservation, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, yeah uh, and I, I have I have I had a few friends that worked in that field here in Tijuana that are not with us anymore. So I remember you reaching out, seeking out some preparation and training related to safety uh, awareness. So yes, yeah, so yeah, of course, you know, come, you know stop stop by basically mm -hmm. um I, I i wasn't fully aware of who you were but i saw you come to a class f motivated and with a like a a lot of people come to some of the classes that i do when i you know, talk about safety awareness uh how to not get into bad situations and how to get out of them mm -hmm. uh people sometimes don't have a clear need for some of that uh, or are not too certain why they're there, but they just want to learn something that they might use one day. You were a Batman. You know, you were there to just I need to learn this for because I have, I have I'm working on this project with these people called Demolera, and I need to keep not only myself safe but everybody involved with it. Mm -hmm. So um, that, to me, that was uh, interesting coming from somebody that comes from where I come from, like culturally. And also somebody that's involved in a project that is basically, hey, we want to tell the truth and communicate some of the stuff that is happening in Mexico. And we are in danger. Mm -hmm. And I felt insanely motivated by that uh, as far as uh, like, how can I help is basically what the conversation mm -hmm. was about. Um, this was a, a few years back. Yeah, right? <laughs> it was. Uh, and then, you know. I offered, like, I get a lot of information. I have a vast network of people across the country and on both sides of the border. So I said, hey, uh, I get all this information all the time, and I'm not too good at analyzing and verifying and cross-referencing, and I don't know if these guys have a political slant or not. Can I offer it to send it to them there for them to mm -hmm. do something with it? And so I, that's, you basically became the the news source that I would say, these this this yeah. is this is what I recommend. Appreciate um, that. I, I, mean, I, I do nothing but just point towards uh, towards you guys. Demolair starts growing, like amazingly. Like it's like it, it's not me. It's all it's the work you're doing, the consistency, the clarity, the honesty, uh, the specific reporting on conflicts in certain regions, mm -hmm. the anal the analyzing information that is coming from government sources as far as death, violence, and all mm -hmm. of these things coming out of the coming out of Mexico. The page starts growing. 
Uh, I've been involved in a few conversations with members of the Senate um, and Congress. And I've seen demo letter being utilized as a, as a source wow. or a reference for some of the things that I heard in some of these hearings and some of these meetings with uh, law enforcement, uh, which I also talk to and, uh, and work with every now and then. So I started, like, I remember, like, ah, I know them. You know, <laughs> started seeing you, you know, pop up in different places like that. Um, it's and amazing. How, and, yeah, it's, it's, it's no, I mean, it, it's, mm. it's, it's amazing how it's been growing and how it's been constantly being referenced as, Mm -hmm. a valid powerful news source that that doesn't doesn't seem to have a slant it, it's like an interesting interesting um mm -hmm. offering out there in, in social media now, what what can you explain to us like what is demo there like first off the the word the word demo there <laughs> <laughs> where does that come from yeah demo it it comes from um, a band called Los Cycles. Um, it's it's known to be or believed to be the first punk band. It is the first. I, I, it's the first. Yeah, it is the first band. I, we're gonna put some of the audio <laughs> now in there. Uh, people listen to that. The time frame and everything. This is this is pre pre UK punk. Pre UK. Oh, yeah. like, this is pre everything in America. So yeah. this is, and they're Latin. They're Latin. Uh -huh. Uh, so they have a song. They have a song. Uh, Demo, Demoler. Demoler. What, what does that song talk about? It talks about breaking down the uh, breaking down a railroad, which is representing for I think this you know the state yeah. breaking down the authority, um, and in, you know in very much Demoler is a product of that. You know, it is a product of, of kind of the youth that I grew, the, that we all grew up in. Yeah. Um, kind of also that that we many times we feel that the state doesn't represent us. You know, what they say publicly doesn't represent us. Yeah. For me as a Mexican, uh, as a Mexican, also somebody who grew up here and went through all this, I would see news related to Latin America, related specifically to Mexico on the U.S. side, and I wouldn't recognize it as my voice mm -hmm. or as something that I would agree with. Or as something that I would verify. Yeah. So, are you saying that? I think Demolaire represents working against that concept that a lot of us Mexican and or people that migrate to the U.S. or, 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 or children of immigrants mm -hmm. that we hear about Mexico through con conventional, traditional news sources or even some online ones that are not that conventional, mm -hmm. but they seem to be detached. So very much so when I saw them all there, I was like, oh, they're working against that actively, you know? Yeah, absolutely. We, you know, in, 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 it, in it's very primal state, it's an effort of deconstructing and kind of, or, and exploring also the narrative that we've been fed this entire time. You know, I think when it comes also to international news sources, there is the idea that, you know, Mexico is just Mexico as a whole, you know, you can't talk about the crime and the violence if you want to promote the tourism, you know, they're almost like, you know, intrinsically linked to each other when it's like, no, no, Mexico is not a monolith. Mexico is not just one broad brush. There's detail, there's nuances, and we need to break that apart. You know, we need to understand that independently. You yeah. know, it could still be a very beautiful tourist destination, but there are still undeniable things that are happening here. And yeah. we're allowed to talk about those. Yeah. We should talk about yeah. both. And, and not in a generalized fashion, like you hear this all the time on in the news, cartels, mm -hmm. cartel violence, cartel this, cartel that. Like it's one big single glob of, of people. And it's We're not. all cartel members. Or, We're all narcos. Yeah. Or, or then you hear the whole aspect of uh, travel advisories to Mexico. Although there's some parts of Mexico that are actually safer than most Amer major American cities, Absolutely. you know, which is pretty, there's no travel advisories to Detroit, for example, yeah. you know, or Chicago. Um, but yeah, the whole aspect of actually breaking down Mexico, mm -hmm. not just by regions, but also by criminal organizations, mm -hmm. uh, trends. D Demolar has been very good about piecing that out for their their audience and kind of like explaining what is going on, who's involved, and not only is it, like, could you divide up, I mean, is it, like, the divide, what Demolar is doing, what, what, it's, what it's specifically focused on covering mm -hmm. as far as uh, coming out of Mexico? Can you kind yeah, of explain absolutely. what that we is? Yeah, absolutely. We focus on crime, conflict, and corruption, um, and we feel that those are three of the most, you know, once you start exploring those, you learn so much 
about the violence in, in Mexico. You learn how intertwined politics is with the violence, with with kind of the narco state that we're experiencing right now. You learn that also crime, you know, in, in many ways, it's also wrapped up into this, oh, this is narco violence happening and everything is a response because of the narco violence. But you start seeing that there's a lot of crime that operates under that shadow that we don't pay attention to. You know, there's a rise of, of femicides. There's a rise of kidnappings against women. And we just tend to slide that under and say, oh, it's, it's this narco, narco state. So, so like when I was in law enforcement, there was this phenomenon that happened. And I think it started happening during the time that I was active. So I was active from 2004 to 2016. I think that's kind of the region that I was really active in. And I got, I got to witness some of it in Juarez specifically. I think mm -hmm. it was the first time I saw that phenomenon where in in the killing fields is what they called it. You know, some of the ladies that work in the maquiladoras uh, were being abducted, raped and murdered. Yeah. And it was being reported as in the media as cartel related or as these people were involved in certain Some aspects shady shit, yeah. at the start not not when the whole picture came to, to light where all these women you know this is not that but you start seeing this phenomenon during that uh start of the drug war specifically during the felipe calderon administration where mm -hmm. a lot of violence or violent acts were being put under the umbrella of cartel activity mm -hmm. and it was just oh it's cartel activity so that means we don't have to really pay attention to it because they also did it to themselves. Yeah. You know, we have this very pervasive understanding that like if you're involved in it or you get killed in some form of fashion, you were probably responsible for it. And that's also another very... It's programming. It was programming that has been done to us. When I say us, I yeah. mean culturally Mexicans. Yeah. Uh, it's a programming that has been going on since the early 2000s where... You see somebody get abducted and killed, or you see somebody get killed in a violent mm -hmm. way, and he in, in the in the in the the immediate doubt comes into your head. He was probably involved in yeah. something. He was shady. He was shady. Yeah. And it can't be that no, maybe he wanted to start a business, and he was getting good at it, and then somebody tried to extort him, and he said no, and mm -hmm. he got killed. You know mm -hmm. that's that's another aspect of it. Or a lady gets picked up, abducted, sexually assaulted, murdered. And mm -hmm. then her body gets dumped in a way that is in alignment with how cartel they do it. stuff yeah. happens. And you can speak to more more about numbers than I can right now because you're mm -hmm. way more informed in that aspect. But how many murders get solved uh, in, in Mexico? Back when I was active, the, the number was like 90% of all murders never get solved in Mexico. It's still like that. It's yeah. still high 90s. I mean, and I see it also with the people that I talk to. I mean, they have completely lost any trust. Um, you know, when a lot, you know, I've been covering the Madres Buscadoras for a while. And they just had a march for Mother's Day in Mexico City. So Madres Buscadoras, can you explain what, the, what that group yeah, is? Yeah, absolutely. So Madres Buscadoras is a collective of volunteers of the relatives of missing persons who basically have taken it upon themselves to go scour deserts looking for human remains. Because the police doesn't want to do any of that law enforcement, the prosecutor's office, they're all completely hands off. You know, if you wait for them to do it, you'll never find it. You'll never get any answers. So there's groups, there's just collectives that have developed all across Mexico. And, you know, they have made some horrifying discoveries. They have discovered clandestine crematoriums just machine level of burning bodies in the middle of deserts. Um, you know, a lot of these have been discovered in Sonora and Chihuahua, Northern state, um, clandestine graves as well, where they just recovered dozens and dozens of bodies. Um, now who are, who are these bodies? Like who's buried there? You know, like, yeah. uh, is it, all, are they all cartel members? Yeah. Is, is that the, is that that's, the, is that the, how it's presented in the media? Mm -hmm. I, at least that's how I've, sometimes seen it presented in the media yeah it's, it still is and yeah. i think by people you know regular citizens observing it too it's like you know we're, we're back to this narrative like oh well he probably did some shady shit yeah he probably put himself in that position could, could, and could some of them be you know kids that were picked up at a party with other kids absolutely that had absolutely nothing to do with it you know? oh absolutely i've talked to mothers who are just like my son was not involved 
you know, I can prove it. He was a fucking child, yeah. you know, and kind of just gets sw- swayed into this, this idea of that. You know, well, sorry. Yeah. You know, I covered a report where this woman had basically, you know, found a cadaver, had sent it to the forensic systems um, for, you know, identification, classification. They returned it in a black trash bag. And, you know, the level of disrespect and, you know, I. There's bodies rotting away and stacked in oh, trucks. Yeah. You know, that's a, like a common story all throughout Mexico Absolutely. because they're completely overwhelmed with the amount of dead bodies. Yeah. We uh-huh. have a forensic crisis, you know, some um, some forensic labs in Jalisco have completely collapsed. You know, they don't have any more space to put these bodies. You know, a few years ago, there was a there was a kind of, you know, controversy that came out because they had just rented these trailers, refrigerated trailers, because they had run out of space. They stuffed the bodies in there, parked the trailers right after their right outside their facilities and another one a few uh, areas away. One of the refrigeration systems failed. And it was found out by the citizens who actually was just like, what the fuck is the smell? <laughs> and they found it. And, you know, it was a, something that we, we, we would have never known. Yeah. Had it not been for this trailer malfunctioning. Yeah. And so, you know, this level of it, it's just, you know, not even in movies do we see this. Yeah, shit. Yeah. It's, it's insane that, you know, so we have these mothers buscadoras, the collective, who find the bodies, and then the bo- they get sent the bo- they send the bodies to get processed by the forensics, and then they never see it again. Yeah. Because we also don't have databases to collect names, DNA. We there's no concise system. Yeah. So, to be able to. So that for people that not, that don't might not know, Mexico was law enforcement in Mexico when the prosecution of uh, of a murder is something that it, that the local state government is involved in mm-hmm. unless it happens on their federal jurisdiction and even when that happens the federal prosecutor's office is not even close to being prepared to investigate a murder of one person much yeah. less of a hundred hundreds of thousands um and some of these institutions some of these uh prosecution office prosecutor's offices uh basically get changed renamed and the leadership gets shuffled around every time there's a new governor. Yeah. And people, you know, the the, the cousin of the governor's wife gets the the new prosecutor's office. So it's mm-hmm. like it's a, it's a pardon my French, it's a shit show. And I've lived through that it myself. Is. You know, mm-hmm. so I I can tell that oh, I can I talk about that a little bit. But um, so you see this completely under-equipped, under-educated effort by the government to procure justice for these victims that is just not to be found uh, um, industrial level body disposal mm-hmm. happening you know people can research El Pozolero El Pozolero is one of many people out there doing some of these things probably so uh, El Pozolero was a guy that uh, basically stew dissolved maker. the stew maker he, he would uh, dissolve bodies in caustic soda that was his MO uh, he said he learned it from Mossad agents, which is, I don't know if the story is true or not, but it's a pretty interesting uh, story he told some of the interrogators that got to talk to him. Um, mm-hmm. But they don't need, some of these groups don't even make that effort. They just burn no. the bodies or just bury them now. Uh, because, and that's a sign of, I think, you talk about escalation. Mm-hmm. You know, in Baja, back when the stew maker was arrested, he was actively trying to get rid of the bodies. I don't do that anymore. No, they don't try. They don't have to. They don't have to because they they just they're aware that the, nothing's gonna happen. Yeah, they're gonna find this body. Nothing's Absolutely. gonna happen. Absolutely. And you know we've also seen that they're very brazen about it. They'll just dump dismembered body parts in the middle of, you know, el centro yeah. in, in a popular area, and nothing happens. Nothing no happens. No arrest. Maybe maybe the maybe the people involved get caught, but the, the involved in, in throwing the bodies out get caught, but they're usually not attached mm-hmm. to them. Yeah. It's, and also what happens with these arrests, you know, because the government trust is so low that we don't even think that, you know, the person that got picked up and arrested or charged for this crime is even the one who did it. So, so Demolera is reporting on, the, I mean, just the 
like in your opinion, would you call this a war? Would you call this an insurgency? Or you, or w how would you define what's happening in Mexico? In the first 72 hours of the Ukrainian conflict, Mexico outperformed that war zone that is declared a war zone by international community. Mexico outperformed that war zone in violent deaths. So what do you call Mexico? What do you yeah. call what's happening here? Yeah, it is still very much the upside down. You know, I think that there's localized areas where there is active war going on. You know, the rival cartel cartels are fighting rival cartels and it is they're employing tactics that are absolutely used in these battle spaces. You know, it, it, it's not any different from these theaters of war that we see plastered all over, you know, the BBC. Yeah. So, um, so, so you, 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 you let's, uh, let's kind of deconstruct it, you know, in this conversation. You see Tijuana, right? Tijuana has conflict in it. There's violence here. There is an ongoing war between rival cartels that are trying to gain control of a local drug market and they're killing each other's mm -hmm. distribution points and sales points um gangland style you know there are a few high level hits that happen there's executions there's abductions that's one side of what's happening in mexico mm -hmm. then you go to michoacan mm -hmm. right what's going on in michoacan yeah, Michoacan. So the battle space right now is between the Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generación, the new uh, Jalisco New Generation, and Carteles Unidos, which is basically different factions that have, you know, part of Los Viagras, Familia Michoacana, uh, Caballos Templarios, or the remnants of it. All of the remnants of the cartels that the old schools got together and formed this. Are are, are like in Michoacan has a history of. Uh, the auto defenses, which mm -hmm. came before that, which mm -hmm. between you and me, the auto defenses were mostly cartel members that kind of like put the T-shirt on of being community policing mm -hmm. vigilantes. Yeah. But they were it okay. later came out that they were basically doing the same kind of thing. Right. Yeah. A lot because, them, yeah. And a lot of them were I think that was enabled by the fact that they were deputized by yeah. Peña Nieto. And so, you know, if you were an auto defensa, you were allowed to carry arms. Whereas if you're a cartel member, they'll kind of arrest you here and there. Yeah. So, you know, it it it, it basically incentivized. It, le it legitimized cartel members that or people that were in organized crime that were part of the community. Mm -hmm. And they legitimized them being armed and policing their community. And then, you know, that kind of, I think that bled into what is happening now where... Mm -hmm. Carteles Unidos, I mean, they call themselves that, which is United Cartels, fighting alongside federal Mexican federal agencies in trench warfare mm -hmm. against the new generation cartel. Yeah. Is that kind of like safe to That's say? That's what I hear from people that I speak to in Michoacan. You know, there is the idea that Carteles Unidos are very much supported by federal forces. You know, that, you know, Guarda Nacional has, you know, some incentive of keeping them kind of in this fight, um, you know, th this this is very much what I hear from from the people that witness it and hear it. Um, and then Jalisco Nueva Generación is, you know, supported by um, another wing. Um, so, you know, it, it is a war that is becoming heavier and heavier. And also the history of these groups, too. They're, you know, they're joined by Milenio. The, so uh, El Mencho... Um, Nemesio Seguerra was part of Milenio Valencia cartel. So was El Abuelo, um, yeah. um, Abuelo Farias, who is kind of the head of Tepaltepec cartel, which is, you know, head of the Carteles Unidos. So, you know, we, when we start deconstructing also the allegiances and the rivalries, you know, you start seeing that they all kind of also come from the same histories, the same lineage, um, you know, and then Milenio broke up into La Resistencia, Los Torcidos, out of Los Torcidos came, you know, what eventually became Jalisco New Generation. So there's a lot of history within also these areas, too, that I think is very inform informative for how we see it developing now. You know, it didn't just come out of a vacuum. Yeah. Um, now, when you when you when we, what do you see with new generation cartels specifically? You know, you mentioned uh, the the historic head of the new generation cartel, Nemesio Segura Cervantes. 
um, who was a former cop. You know, mm-hmm. what's interesting? He's a former cop. Um, the U.S. actually had him in custody for yeah, a bit, which is arrested. interesting. You know, he's arrested in, uh, for heroin smuggling, I mm-hmm. think. He comes back. He's ahead of this uh, new generation cartel. We, we first started hearing about it during the, like, I don't know, what, like, late to late, uh, mid to late 2000s. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the first major event that the name uh, at an international level that the new generation cartel was named or attached to was them downing a federal helicopter in 2015 in 2015 yeah. over uh where was this i mean it, it was uh, it was over their controlled territory they they used a russian rpg mm-hmm. on a black hawk helicopter a black hawk helicopter donated by the u.s government to mexican authorities they're flying really low um they were not they didn't realize that these people had anti-aircraft capabilities and that became the president like that, that's that's mm-hmm. not only still uh an issue for flying over mexico yeah. and, uh, as a, as a law enforcement in the military uh, aspect but they basically escalated the violence in a way mm-hmm. in, in mexico so you they set the tone. They set the tone of what comes next. Yeah. That, um, the aspect of cartel members keeping it low key, uh, maybe the violence would be very prevalent in some places, but they would try and keep a low key and control, maybe not full co- confrontation with the with the government. And then mm-hmm. they just make a helicopter go down, you know, yeah. and gain control over big swaths of territory, of territory yeah. where they themselves are now the government. In mm-hmm. a way, you know, they, absolutely. The, in some of these areas, they don't go to the police, they go to them. Yeah, so, absolutely. And it, they're fulfilling these functions that, you know, are limited to the or what we would expect are limited to the government. You know, during COVID, they were out distributing the spensas, like food baskets, you know. And, I, and enforcing mass policy. Absolutely. And curfews. And it was, you know, this level of blatant control of territories you know we're not talking small towns we're talking you know collective of towns and people followed it you know why i think it's worth exploring um you know i think everybody has different motivations i think fear is very much high up there but they started implementing their own kind of you know government in a lot of these areas they were distributing the spensas they were enforcing masks curfews in Jalisco, they had a flood, a flash flood with a few homes, you know, just, you know, their their furniture got wiped away. They were there the next day distributing mattresses and refrigerators. And, you know, for Mother's Day, they go out and distribute microwaves and appliances. And, you know, they are fulfilling a role. Now, when we talk about cartels, I mean, most people culturally and people that watch netflix and the narcos series and stuff like that and that's the concept or the image that they have of, of, of cartels you know there's mm-hmm. these guys in flashy clothes maybe you know operating in cells and you know paying off and corrupting the military and all this type of stuff new generation cartel is a different animal in that aspect or at least that's how it's seen you know that's how they've been kind of like differently influencing their whole growth and mm-hmm. how they've been taking control of large parts of the Mexican territory. Sinaloa cartel in comparison to the to, to the new generation cartel. Can you can you explain what their differences are as, as far as how you Demolair has been able to kind of mm-hmm. cover that? Yeah, we see that Jalisco cartel has taken huge territories by just absolute force. You know, with some aspects of the Sinaloa cartel, we see, um, you know, I, I will hit a new um, talking point here about their 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 fragmentation, but we saw them still maintain a certain line of you know control within their areas. You know, I, I've spoken to a few people in Sinaloa who are just like, no, this is you know, it they keep the control. That's why you know they say that Sinaloa is very low in the homicide. You know, they have a certain le- degree of just you know, maintaining that status quo, whereas like all of the areas of Jalisco cartel are some of the highest homicide rates that we see. Um, And also the active, you know, conflict areas, they're actively uh, conflicting around or against these, these local 
gangs or local, you know, in Guanajuato, they take now Santa, um, um, oh my God, Santa Rosa de Lima. Yeah, Santa Rosa de Lima. Yeah. Um, they, they, they've taken down that cart that they, yeah. they just they basically wiped it out. Yeah. You know, they, they weakened it so much that, I, you know, before El Marro got arrested, um, and El Marro is ahead of um, Santa Rosa, he, you know, I started seeing a lot of chatter around, you know, some of these cops were turning, and suddenly it was just like, oh, he's not meeting payroll. Yeah. And it was those little interesting things that you start, you know, you start picking up on those little details, on those little triggers. And, 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 and yeah, and he, he, was, he wasn't arrested by the Mexican authorities, I mean, federal authorities, he was arrested by this, like a state agency. Yeah. Which is very interesting. Very suspect. Very suspect and very interesting that those were the guys that found him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm not saying that they're, they're not good at their job, but it was interesting that the, the, their influence in the area as far as law enforcement and how they were kind of on their side, all of a sudden they turned Switch. and they're not there on mm-hmm. that side. That's an interesting observation. Yeah. So this is how you start seeing kind of these areas also start changing, you know, with, um, you know, the difference between... Uh, Sinaloa is, you know, we we can talk a little bit about also the the fragmentation between like El Mayo Zambada's side and Los Chapitos. And after the arrest of El Chapo, you know, it started kind of going into two different areas. And so within Sinaloa, we start seeing a lot of infighting as well, uh, which I think is interesting because I think that, you know, the perspective is that these cartels are finding the rivals. But, you know, there's a lot of nuance. There's a lot of uh, different groups within one cartel in general anyway that, you know, some some guys say something that the other guy didn't like, you know, it, 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 the, the, they say that the, the, the fragmentation started between conflict between El Nini and El Russo. Um, yeah. Different, you know, one of the, El Russo part of Zambada, Nini part of Los Chapitos. And then so it starts creating a bigger... A bigger you know, conflict within the same, the same big part. Absolutely. Yeah, it's um, interesting. Um, the the arrest of El Chapo Guzman that has been used as a trophy for U.S. authorities and also Mexican authorities, mm-hmm. like has it did it do anything? It didn't. It did. It, 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 it did absolutely nothing. Anything significant, or at least what we wanted it to, absolutely yeah. not. As far as the, the amount of press effort, the trial. All of it, it violence hasn't lowered their influence and their trafficking hasn't done didn't stop it or make it smaller. Yeah, it is getting worse and it's getting absolutely. You know, and 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 after that we have the Culiacanazo, which uh-huh. we can talk about in a bit. Yeah. Um. So, El Culiacanazo happens. Uh, El Chapo's arrested. He's being uh, prosecuted in the United States. Mm-hmm whole circus around his uh his trial his sons are left in control in his absence Mm -hmm. and one of them gets arrested by members of federal law enforcement in mexico and this is at the start of the current presidential administration right now in mexico um he gets arrested Mm -hmm. He gets sent to a an office, a federal office in in in, in uh, Culiacan, and there's a call out for every single able-bodied cartel member with a gun to come to his aid. Can you talk a little bit about this event, that this Culiacan also event? Yeah, it was absolutely insane. I mean, immediately when that happened, we start seeing videos on, you know, social media, people that I know from Sinaloa, Sinaloa, just, you know, the city stopped. And all forces, all Sinaloa forces, cartel, went to go rescue Ovidio. Yeah. And by rescue, I mean, they went toe to toe with the military. You know, the, the methods that they employed too were, you know, it was one of the, you know, seeing it from the outside, it was extremely well orchestrated for seeing something happen just like that. You know, they basically also targeted the wives and relatives of some of the soldiers that were in that operation, you know, effectively basically stifling them. 
um, you know, the weapons that we saw them coming out with, you know, the technicals, you know, they, they were on pickup trucks with massive guns in the back. I mean, this was, they took the city under siege and he was let go because of it. Yeah. You know, they beat the military. So, so we, we were like, we were in contact during this whole situation. Um, and we were like sending videos back and forth. And I think one of the one of the interesting videos that I I, also, I think I, I saw you share or somebody shared, and it was like would comment on it the fact that the businesses were being evacuated, not by law enforcement, mm-hmm. not by the military, but cartel members would show up and say, "Ladies and gentlemen, pick up your things, leave towards the east. The, there's going to be some conflict happening here. Take your families. Don't worry about anything." And calmly, everybody was paying attention, and they were just being evacuated by the cartels. Those were the guys doing the evacuation and keeping civilians safe Safe. as the military was showing up. Mm -hmm. That was mind-blowing to see. It was insane. And, you know, it really shows how big, you know, the, the weapons that they were carrying the foot soldier i mean it was just dozens of people that came anti-aircraft capability was in full display there that's why the you uh, you didn't see any of the gunships flying over and uh, and engaging targets yeah. because they knew well enough not to do anything like that because mm-hmm. it is an, an open secret that the sinaloa cartel in culecan has the his they have every, yeah. they have the air basically yeah. that's why you don't see a lot of that op- that type of operation happening in that in that region Mm-hmm. You see videos of the army shaking hands with cartel members, basically saying, "You know what? Peace. We're peace. We're cool." Yeah. Um, and the the GoPro video of you know, I remember talking about this with you of when they find Ovidio in his house, and his security guard comes out. You know, he has a gun. Um, and they basically, I think, you know, they were very much in surprise. Yeah, it yeah. was a, so the the federal government has the official statement that they were targeting him and they found him and they arrested him. What you see in that video is shock, like oh, yeah. And also, if somebody walks out of a room with a gun on him in that fashion, takes the gun out, that person would be shot. In most of my experience mm-hmm. working myself in that environment. But you can see clearly that they were completely in fear and shock for, and sa- for their for their safety. They treated him with a with a weird level of respect. respect. And you know they allowed him to take out a gun and give it to somebody in the room. And you know his aunt they was allowed out. to. He was making phone calls. Yeah, it was it was it was an interesting. I, I don't know why they would publish that video, but they published that video. He was wearing a Santo Niño de Tocha. Uh, um, Mm-hmm. Uh, Scapulario, which became very popular, you couldn't find one yeah. in Sinaloa. After that happened, everybody the wanted shirt one. he was wearing sold out. <laughs> yeah, which is another interesting aspect of some of the veneration and the popular uh, popularization of some of the culture mm-hmm. uh, iconography related to the, to, the, to the, car- the Sinaloa cartel. He's let go. Mm-hmm. Is the official statement by the federal government uh, headed by uh, AMLO? Mm-hmm. Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, which we're going to talk about specifically in a bit, is that they, fearing further violence and further issues with uh, with an open conflict with the cartels, decided to let him go. Mm-hmm. According to some of the people that I know and some of the sources that I have, that was not the case. Mm-hmm. They didn't. The, the federal office where he was being held they received no such orders. They let him go because they were surrounded and yeah. they were about to be taken you know, by force. Yeah. So, and I mean, it's it's also contradicting, you know, what the president is saying relating to these uh, individuals. Is you know, there's no arrest warrant right now for Ovidio. So the sole idea that there was an operation for him is very much contradicted by what we see, yeah. you know, and, and, and we just continue finding more and more of those contradictions. I mean, uh, going a little bit beyond the Culicanazo, it, it, you know, when Cienfuegos got arrested in the U.S., the former Secretary General of Defense. Uh, on, on, arre- on corruption charges. Yeah, 
of working re- directly re- with a cartel. Recorded phone calls of him talking to members of La Familia. Yeah. And arrested first step in U.S. soil, arrested. Um, AMLO fought hard to get him back, said that there were, be, there were going to be concerted investigations to assess, you know, whether those claims were true and all charges were dropped. As Nothing soon as he happened. got back. Yeah. Um, so. Basically, his arrest was part of an investigation that U.S. had on Luna, yeah. who was... Genaro oh, Garcia Luna. Genaro Garcia Luna. Uh, I think all of them were attached to a specific cartel that apparently during the Felipe Calderon administration mm-hmm. was favored and or protected, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, so they were part of the Sinaloa cartel, essentially. And then when the split happened in Beltran Leyva. Los Beltran, Los Beltran Leyva. Not, uh-huh. the fami- not La Familia, Los Beltran Leyva. Yeah. And, you know, it's almost, you, you start seeing records of kind of like also like a split between, you know, like, oh, shit. Now, whose side are we going to be on? Um you know, and, and that also is a sign of, you know, who started falling. Yeah, yeah. And so you see this high-level Mexican uh, general arrested. And and it's kind of unheard of that such a high-profile arrest is done and charges are being brought up and then they all get dropped. Yeah. And he gets flown back to Mexico. Mm-hmm. And, and allowed to live as a private citizen. I, I think, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a long standing thing with me that I, I realize that power in Mexico is concentrated in the military. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're, they're at the end of the day, you can elect whoever you want to be in that presidential seat, but who is really in charge is the military. And military leadership is very much an influence in Mexico outside of everything else. Mm-hmm. So that was an interesting display of that power. It's That's... not a common one, but it was an interesting display mm-hmm. of that power. So you have AMLO, you know, coming in, uh, winning the presidential elections, almost in a landslide victory. Nobody could stand against him because everybody that was running against him in those presidential elections represented political parties that had been long since been burned by corruption, Mm -hmm. scandals, and the citizenship was just like done with all of that. So you, you have this to the left populist character come out that had run for the presidency mm-hmm. several times over, even when he was, ran against Felipe Calderon mm-hmm. and lost under dubious circumstances. Uh, he declared himself the president of the people. Remember that? Yeah. Like he like, went out there, he put a presidential sash on himself. Like I'm the one that won. So he, you know, he pulled a Trump in a way, in a way, you know, when, before Trump was cool. Yeah. He, he sweeps into the presidency. Culiacan uh, also happens. And he adopts a policy that has, you know, now been kind of like nicknamed and or tagged as abrazos, no, no balazos. balazos. Basically, hugs, not bullets. Mm-hmm. And he promises to do everything contrary to Felipe Calderon, who is his political enemy. And he said, well, he's wrong for militarizing policing in mexico he was wrong for taking the war to the cartels we're not going to do any of that Mm -hmm. and the first thing he does is he militarizes the the federal police you know and he puts military leadership there um he changes the name of the federal police into the guardia nacional basically just a new uniform change and a name change new face new face but it does basically the same policies Mm -hmm. with oculia canasso you can see kind of where he's where like the strategy is Mm -hmm. uh, a strategy of let's stand back Mm -hmm. let's let them sort everything out themselves Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a video of him talking to El Chapa Guzman's mom Mom. and then the lawyer which is I mean I don't know if that uh, people didn't really care he was visiting uh, Vandira Guanto which he has a few times like a very specific place that Mm -hmm. he's visited as a president several times one of the times he was there he did a press conference where he was talking about how there's a threat with Chinese drugs coming in, because what about the local drug drug uh, producers there? Like, what about their jobs? Yeah. Which is, has been like mind blowingly funny to kind of hear him say that. What 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 do you think about his uh, his presidency till now? Like, is this this mm-hmm. whole policy of standing back, abrazo no balazos, there's no problem, nothing's happening type policy? Yeah, it's I mean dissecting the policy itself 
uh, he he coined the term abrazos no balazos during his campaign that now has just become kind of a just satirical performance of security. Um, but his entire security posture when he came in was divided onto eight points. And what he advocated for was basically, you know, we're going to draw them away from crime. We're going to incentivize to stay away from it, which included all of these socioeconomic policies and, you know, more of the social uh, aspect of it. Opportunities for young people so they don't go to work for the cartels. Exactly. In theory. In theory. Big theory. Yeah. And, you know, I think for a second we give merit to that policy and we try to explore it from that from that facet, you know, where are those social policies? Where where are these socioeconomic incentives that, you know, were promised? You know, we went through COVID and COVID was greatly devastating because a lot of this economy works informally. Yeah. You know, they don't have safety nets. They don't have, you know, they have to constantly hustle and work. And, you know, I'm sure you can talk about this, but what I saw in Mexico was, you know, we didn't get anything. There, there was no support mechanisms there during COVID, during one of the hardest economic times that we were asked to stay at home and respect. Yeah, the, there was no stimulus checks coming in the mail for Mexicans. There was no breaks. There was no. Uh, we're gonna. We're not gonna ask for taxes. It was. It was. Yeah, it, it was asking us to stay away without providing any alternatives for us to stay away. And you know, people had to continue working. So you know, we're talking about this whole. You know, we're going to reshift the security spectrum and change that theater so that we don't incentivize them into going into it. Sure, that sounds great in theory, but where are they? You yeah. know, this is, you know, the recruitment for cartel organizations has exponentially increased during these times yeah. because they see that there's a huge void that, that, you know, they're filling. So, you know, just on that aspect, I don't see a co cohesive or concise agenda or plan how this security policy could be effective you know i think we all can agree that the war on drugs was just an absolute shit show failure a complete failure it's, it's, it's been a complete fa failure it, it was doomed to start from the very beginning you know just the fact that gerardo garcia luna was is is already facing uh charges for directly working with the cartels i mean that in itself is inherently a failure but you know, to come into this administration and say that we need to change what has failed before by more failed policies is, it's hard to take that seriously. I mean, we see it every day. There's no, the morale also across the country is going so low. I mean, we, we hear on the side him telling us, you know, abrazos no balazos, we're going to deal with this problem in a way that we haven't dealt with it before. You know, the bullets aren't working. Okay, I agree that, you know, we, we need to step back in, in committing human rights abuses. Yeah. But how are we filling up that space? You know, he just a couple of weeks ago, he said that, you know, we're going to treat these gang members as... As normal people, as brothers. Yeah. So he said something. We, we're concerned about the safety of our soldiers and our police, but we're also concerned about the safety of their muchachos. We're also concerned about because they're human beings too. So, what does that even mean? You know, does it mean yeah. we're not going to go after them? We're not going to shoot back? And that comes. What does that mean? Yeah. And that comes a day after you know the Sedena was filmed retreating from seven seven vehicles in Michoacan who were just kicking them out of the city yeah you know Dis disarmed and, some of them some of them disarmed uh, yeah. uh cartel members openly threatening uh, uh, a military official that they were going to hang from a bridge yes and they're forgiving they're forgiving him his life but just leave absolutely and and he you know it's sad to say that he was there in the video with a tail between its legs you yeah. know almost thanking them for yeah. sparing his life um you know interesting aspect of this that doesn't get really talked about it a lot all that much People can go on TikTok and you'll see cartel videos that are very much kind of propaganda-ish. Mm -hmm. But you'll also see Mexican military army pride propaganda videos yeah. showing Guardia Nacional as this amazing policing force. And, I mean, you've been here in Tijuana. You've seen Guardia Nacional yeah. moving around. Guardia Nacional as a police agency, as a new police agency, is supposedly like the main law enforcement federal wing 
that is going to combat violence in Mexico. That's what they se- that's who they send. You see them here? They're hanging out, walking around with rifles on the street. Or they, they get planted on different street corners. And they do absolutely nothing. Um, you see them, you know, patrolling in areas, roadblocks and stuff like that. They're doing absolutely nothing that hasn't been done by the Fe- Felipe Calderon administration with mm-hmm. their federal police, ver- the, their version of that same federal agency. Do you see absolutely no change? No. no and change. it's getting worse, you know, it's arguably, it, it, you know, because there's an absence of a concise security strategy, we've almost left a huge void. And, you know, what I see the president doing is acting very reactively. You know, there, there's no proactive measures about how we're going to treat this problem in a long term um, strategy or sustainable strategy. It's almost just reaction. You know, after the soldiers were basically kicked out of Michoacan, he deployed, uh, you know, 1,200 um, forces to fix that problem. So, you know, it's almost like a back and forth. He's telling us, no, we need to demilitarize the streets, but tomorrow we're going to send more military in. And we need to deal with this problem effectively and tackle the social mechanisms behind it. But we're going to go through a crisis and not really do that. So it's very difficult to have any confidence. And I see this also with the people. You know, I talk to, you know, just the tamales lady or el vendedor de tacos like a taco stand and just Irregu- have a, irregular commerce people basically exactly yeah, outside of the yeah and you know just have a frank conversation with them and they're in it by themselves you know i yeah. think everybody feels that we're just you know we're we're fighting for ourselves so you, so you see like do so you have an interesting perspective you know you saw an uprising in the middle east Mm-hmm. At first hand, where you know one of them was an individual that was a fruit vendor. Mm-hmm. I imagine in the informal market, basically, one of them a a, a, a kid getting tortured, and brutality, and that kind of. We've seen the Floyd situation in in, in the U.S. and what that mm-hmm. did, as far as how that erupted a whole country into violence. Mm-hmm. You know. And put, uh, uh, related to police brutality. What is wrong with us? Like, why don't we erupt in violence when mm-hmm. one of our women gets murdered? Murdered. And not only murdered by, uh, not only murdered, but law enforcement lies about the, the nature of that. Mm-hmm. Or... Yeah, you go back into the recent past, you see a casino in Mon- Monterrey where cartels mm-hmm. chain the doors and burn everybody alive in it. Uh, you see, uh, again, going back into the recent past, you go to Monterrey, you see students from a, from a university get shot by government agents yeah. and guns planted on them and they say, oh, they were just cartel members, which mm-hmm. was a complete and blatant lie. Fabrication. Mm-hmm. And we don't in- erupt in protest yeah. violence. What is wrong with us? What, in your opinion, what is wrong with us? And I, I include myself because this, what's wrong with us? Yeah. You know, I think it's, it's a matter of self-preservation because I think if we were really to pay attention to what is going on, we would all go insane. You know, I think there is an effort to minimize it in our every day because these are figures that are absolutely ridiculous. The homicide rates, the level of disappearances, the level of just extortion. We're, we're talking about some of the official numbers that Demo every now and then post up, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I think you're, I mean, again, you're one of the only agencies that I've seen that has a consistent uh, track record of posting up official numbers that are being put forth by the government, which Mm-hmm. You can talk about if they're, they're correct or not, but you will do the service of just reporting on those numbers, and mm-hmm. you do it over the over the year. We're like tracking it, like, oh, look, yeah. this this the state is now number one. It used to not be number one. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I can I can talk about those numbers, but going back to the question about you know what is wrong What's, with yeah. us, I think I, you know, for for just 
I can't answer that question without it just being gravely disappointed in, yeah. in us. In us. Yeah. You know, I've covered so many massacres. You know, I think in the beginning it was like maybe someone will care about this one. Yeah, like, the, okay, the, this this is going to be the one that's going to change. Them. Yeah. And then, okay, this one, children died. Maybe they'll care. The next one. Oh, the next one. And then, you know, I saw something change when I covered Le Baron massacre yeah. uh, with the Mormon family. But also the way that it was spoken about was also very different. You know, they were, they were talking about Americans and they were talking about, you know, a Mormon community. And it was very much different from us. Yeah. You know, there was it was they, they were special because of the color of their skin in a, in a, in a way. And they were special because they had dual citizenship. Mm hmm. And also there were women and children, so that mm -hmm. made it even more alarming. But that's happened before in Mexico with people that every are not. Week. Every week. Absolutely. But that one was treated like, <gasps> Yeah. And the U.S. got involved and the U.S. made a comment. And, you know, maybe I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe this something, it. maybe that'll wake us up a little bit. Came and went. And, you know, I, I, I also see it in myself. You know, I think covering daily just the level of death, you start becoming desensitized to it. And I, you know, I fight every day to like maintain that sensitivity to it because I do want to still retain the idea or the knowledge that these are human beings. But the gravity in which it's happening, there is no way to deal with it and take it in a normal way unless you minimize it. And I think that that's what we've done on a mass scale now. I think, you know, it is a matter of self-preservation. It's a matter of retaining our sanity because once we start thinking about what the actual problem is and how big that problem is, we will go fucking insane. Yeah, I, mean, we, I think insanity is a good, interesting thing to say. Uh, Me Me Mexico is a country where you can have a massacre of the level of what happened in Monterrey of the uh, feminicides as, as, as mm -hmm. now they're being called basically murders of all kinds mm -hmm. with people that shouldn't, you know, shouldn't be a thing. We will, as Mexicans, we will put a Ukrainian flag over our Facebook profile and stand with Ukraine yeah. as our youth is literally dying and disappearing and rotting in the ground. Mm -hmm. And this is who we are. Absolutely. And this is this is, this is something we this is something I point out in myself in in, in us as a, as a as a country we're we are completely detached from our own reality and the escapism that some social media sometimes provides for us yeah. where we're like looking at a conflict zone across the ocean and standing mm -hmm. with Ukraine and standing with you we saw protests related to the Floyd situation <laughs> in Mexico yeah <laughs> insane yeah uh we see protests related to feminism and related to gender pronouns in mexico in mexico city mm -hmm. and like violent ones with mm -hmm. a lot of energy with a lot of coverage mm -hmm. yet the amount of just horrible nightmarish things that happen mm -hmm. in this country just get yeah I was in, so this past uh, Mother's Day, I was mentioning there were protests from the Madres Buscadoras, the, the relatives of missing persons. They, they orchestrated a project, uh, protest in Mexico City. They first started in front of the presidential palace. No one came to receive them. No one paid attention. One official came for a couple of minutes, did a few kind of formalities, uh, spoke to a woman who was leading the march. She comes every single year she's in a wheelchair older woman every single year she comes to mexico city she's from jalisco to protest this to say that this is wrong and i mean i was there standing i think i was one of the only media people that were covering this yeah. you know asking questions you know how long have you been coming here what would you want to say about this you know what what do you feel that the government's supporting you helping you and it's just the, the indignation, you know, from the government side to address these issues. Yeah. I mean, I think it's become so easier to deal with, you know, what's popular and what's kind of, you know, a theatrical yeah. say yeah. for, you the know, gender politics now are a thing and they're all over the news uh, pronouns uh, in Mexico. We're talking about Mexico, yeah. uh, uh, you know, and, and some of these things just get like. Yeah, major... this isn't pretty. Let's dig yeah. it let's push it's not it under popular. let's dig it under uh yeah. we are 
you know, this past year was pretty, with numbers, talking about numbers, mm -hmm. was a pretty violent year. Mm -hmm. It's getting, is it safe to say that it's getting, the numbers are getting skyrocketing, basically, mm -hmm. as we go. It's yeah. not getting better. We don't see a downward trend when it comes to violent murders in this country or forces appearances. Mm -hmm. We don't see a downward trend when it comes to media not being targeted. or like, we just Going we, ju up. we just saw a reporter from from this part of the country, if yeah. you want to go down there and in a press conference say, hey, president, people mm -hmm. are trying to kill me. Yeah. People are trying to kill me. Uh, can you do something about this? Uh, we'll figure it out. They killed her. Kill them. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's not it's not an isolated case. And like it's it's it's, uh, it's pretty insane to kind of experience and see. Like where do you see this trends heading? Like where are we going with these with these numbers? Like what's happening? I mean, to to start from, you know, a, a kind of a disclaimer that I always put or that we always put in all of these posts is that these are the official numbers, but these aren't the actual numbers. You know, and we make a point to show these numbers because that's the only figure that we get. You know, we collect these numbers on the daily. So, and it's, I mean, that process in itself is difficult. They definitely don't make it easy for you to have a track of, of the homicide rate. It's, it's not in their best interest to, to put out the actual numbers. And I, I was I was a part of the government. And I can tell you that those numbers are not, are not real, are not even close. Absolutely. And we've been collecting this for since we, we all started the page, but from... You know, a year ago when we finished our tally that we had from these government numbers, the official government put out another tally, which was 6,000 figures different. You know, there was no explanation for that discrepancy. We had we found no methodology for how this happened. You know, so we are doing our best to collect these numbers and we are already going into it knowing that these government numbers are not accurate. You know the the actual because they're also not counting the 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 incidences where you know a body is not discovered. Um, you know what happens to the bodies that are picked up in clandestine graves are those placed in these figures? You know we we have no answers for that. So it's going higher, and there is no sign that it's there's no there's easy. no indication of a downward trend or. Uh, any of that no and you know the president went on a mañanera his morning conference and he said you know we have a three percent reduction rate in homicides that sounds great in theory you know the way that you're presenting it but let's actually look at those numbers three percent in some of the highest numbers that we've seen in our history is marginally insignificant you know we're being fed this idea that we're getting better and you know our policies are working but when we actually see those numbers even knowing that they're not accurate, they're still some of the worst homicide rates that we've seen. You know, we're talking about conflict, war zone level homicides. And, you know, I was talking to a taxi driver when the, in 2019, when the highest figures first came out. And, you know, we were listening to a radio broadcast and, and they were like over 34,000. And I'm like, what do you think about this? He's like, you know, what he said was really interesting because he's like, we're the only country not at war with these numbers. And then he kind of just smiled a little bit. He's like, but we're still a couple million anyway. You know, and that level of kind of you trying to rationalize yeah. this insanity yeah. that yeah, it's going back to being insane. So we're not at war. You know, Mexico isn't at war. Uh, if you... If I look at the conflict from uh, from an outside perspective, I, I'd see uh, a very unique insurgency happening within Mexico, where there's se several factions fighting against the government in conjunction with the government, mm -hmm. and being funded by outside influences and money and guns and all of this. Right? Basically, I, in Mexico, I see a proxy war of a sort. You know, you definitely, in my in my opinion, I see an influence by. You know, uh, during the COVID epidemic, the only cartel that grew in an exponential fashion was the new generation cartel. And I think it probably has something to do with their access to Pacific side ports. Mm -hmm. It probably had something to do with the fact that they were not uh, cut off from fentanyl coming out of China and precursors to make their product. Uh, so, you know, our cartel was actually smuggling fentanyl from the U.S. into Mexico to mm -hmm. then put into a product and smuggle it back. Um so if you know if you were if 
you're uh, Alex Jones enough, you would think that Mexico is kind of a Vietnam in a way where there's proxy uh, agents working uh, for, for different sides. Mm -hmm. It is very much an open conflict area, I think. Um, just because it isn't raining in your backyard right now doesn't mean it's not raining somewhere. So a lot mm -hmm. of people that live in Mexico, that another aspect of it, you know, this is Tijuana. Like you, you, mm -hmm. you, you've been around here for a bit. You see all the apartment buildings going up. You see property uh, property prices uh, raising. You see a lot of the COVID uh, refugees living down here and economic mm -hmm. refugees living down here now. And with them, they're bringing their drug market specifically. It's a lot of Americans are like creating a, a, a big demand and drug market in Mexico. Uh, marijuana trafficking happens from San Diego to Tijuana now, which is fascinating. Yeah. And they are moving into a country that is basically at war. So Americans have a, various opinions or, uh, as, as far as Mexico being a country that is at war or not, and also mm -hmm. what the cartels are. Mm -hmm. What do you think about cartels and criminal groups being designated as a terrorist organization like, was, like what was talked about during the past Trump administration? Mm-hmm. Yeah, this 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 question is very uncomfortable to people. I realized, um, you know, I think from my own experiences, what I saw is, you know, when we talk about this, we talk about you know cartels being terrorists or some or terrorist organizations. You know, are we analyzing, you know, the the motive, the action, or the effect? Because when I see the effect. It's the same. It's no different from the communities that were suffering under ISIS and the communities that are suffering under, you know, what's going on between Jalisco Cartel and Carteles Unidos or between what was happening in Guanajuato. Mm -hmm. You know, the the effect that it causes is exactly the same. Now, when we talk about, you know, are you know, are these political ideologies or are, you know, their motives are not politically aligned enough? We just also went through one of the most violent elections this past year, and we're about to enter a new one. You know, over 84 politicians were killed. You know, 34 of them were candidates. You know, 100 of them, 100 people that worked in the elections themselves were also murdered. I mean, there is an incentive for these cartel organizations to operate within that political space. And, and and when the people are when people hear that oh this political candidate was assassinated he wasn't assassinated because he was looking for change no he was assassinated because he was probably the candidate of one of the rival cartels and you don't want that guy in there so we shoot yeah, him yeah absolutely you know? and we want to place our own so definitely cartels ha cartels and when I say cartels there's different factions different mm -hmm. groups it's not a single solid group each of these factions have a political agenda in a way then they do. so we'll check that mark off as political uh, as them being designated as a terrorist organization and when we talk about designating them I'm, I'm you can talk about defining them as a as a terrorist organization like by like defining mm -hmm. them a, in a book but the u.s government designating these organizations as a terrorist, uh, these or these criminal enterprises as terrorist organizations, and that what that would do as far as freeing up the ability to the of the U.S. to do certain things to go after certain elements of their finances, people that influence and or mm -hmm. work with them, and how that would affect a broader range of how to attack this problem. Yeah. Uh, they're politicized. Mm -hmm. Do they use terror tactics to influence the local populace? Um, they are using drone, civilian drones mm -hmm. in very much the fashion that was developed in the Middle East. Middle East. You know, civilian drones dropping 40 millimeter grenades uh, with badminton uh, attachments. So they stabilize their drops, which is brilliant if you think about it. Mm -hmm. um, they started putting pesticides in it chemical basically homemade chemical weapons now um they are upping their game as far as fourth generation warfare and mm -hmm. uh, I, the reason that i am sometimes asked to go and advise and or train government forces in the u.s is because i have a knowledge base in this you know so they they themselves have realized oh this is interesting that this is an interesting university of a space and let's talk to ed about some of these mm -hmm. things um 
there was a threat to make them an, to, to to designate them a, a terrorist organization when i th- i think was done by trump to pressure mexico mm-hmm. into enforcing its own borders because they were dealing with the whole car- migrant caravan crisis which is kind of petered out now it's not it's not a, that's not at the top of the agenda anymore um what would you think the effects of them actually being designated a terror organization that, mm-hmm. what, what, what will that even look like yeah if we talk about it from mexico from a you know so effectively designating them a terrorist organization would mean that all financing to these organizations would be countered as you know you supporting an organization a terrorist organization let's look at all of the politicians that are involved in there all of that political arena that would suddenly be susceptible to these laws you know, is there enough political will to make those laws effective or to even have that appetite to, you know, clean house to, you know, governors, municipal mayors, their uh, families, their, their businesses, everything. Oh, and also, you know, when it comes to also extortion, is the farmer who has an avocado plantation pays the extortion? Is he financing terrorist organizations? Yeah. You know, that becomes such a immense landscape there that I don't think we have the political will to ever want to tackle it. We don't have certainly the appetite to want to implicate ourselves. You know, many of these political heads would effectively be implicating themselves. Tequila companies, BevMo would be targeted to yeah. targeted by like if they sell any of these bottles there, you know, yeah, Netflix supporting some of these series that uh, kind of talk about sensationalizing the i don't know like uh, yeah. the, the the scope of it could be so massive yeah. and also i think you have now many mexicans who are living in the united states illegally um that are undocumented basically mm-hmm. um now have a legitimate claim claim to asylum to asylum and that would mm-hmm. you know that, that would change the uh, so you you hear this constantly. I'm sure you get it in the comments uh, when 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 Demolair posts something. Let's uh, let's get the U.S. involved. Let's send some drones down there. Let's send some mm-hmm. ground forces down there. Some boots on the ground. What do you think that would even look like? Uh, I mean, that I I'm concerned about that. Seeing as we have seen that in other countries, you know, the level of violence that it has created, the level of, you know, where would they even start with who, you know, is it going to be a full nationwide invasion? You know, are boots going to go on the ground everywhere? Are they going to go in concentrated areas? You know, just that, it just entertaining that landscape. Yeah. It's because, you know, it, it's also, these organizations operate within the people. Yeah. You know, it, when I hear like a comment, let's just go fucking nuke them or, <laughs> you know, is you're you're talking about entire communities here. Yeah. You know, the problem is so pervasive because we've allowed it yeah. to become this way. You know, they, they live, you know, among us. Yeah. So what what would that look like and how would that look like? You know, it, it definitely does breed a lot of concern, um, but it doesn't. Eliminate also, I have concerns with my own government. They're not even addressing the, the problem. Yeah. Um, you know, they, you know, I, I'm interested to hear in your thoughts about I that. I mean, it's, a, it's, not, it's not overseas. You can put every single Marine that you have in the U.S. on that border. It's not going to be enough to stop the wave, massive wave of migration of people mm-hmm. coming out of this country, fleeing a conflict. Mm-hmm. So... I, I don't know. And also, we're tied by blood. Mm-hmm. So, like, family members on this side, on that side, cart- there's a there's a delusional aspect that Americans have that cartels are just in Mexico and they're not spread out all over the country yeah. in the United States. I think you can recognize them. Yeah, you can. Uh, pointy boots and a hat, you know. I think that's a, I don't know. It is such a complicated issue and it's very much a regional issue Mm -hmm. that we as the united states and mexico are completely economically culturally and blood tied you know we just went through a pandemic where illegal farm workers were basically essential workers Mm -hmm. because because they provided food so Mm -hmm. that's an interesting aspect to that right (laughs) 
And they are. Yeah. Um, hotels, restaurants, all the industry services, most of the, you know, in the United States are directly tied to mm-hmm. people irregularly moving through mm-hmm. the borders. And how that all ties into actually going after cartel organizations through using military force and trying to intervene in Mexico might be kicking a beehive yeah. that will, you know, it's, it's a very complex. Absolutely. And, and you talked also about, the, you know, the weapon systems that they have. That's going to be a very... I mean, they can take it out in planes. You know, they can take it out in a plane if they, they, if they wanted to. You know, mm-hmm. so that, that's an interesting aspect to it. I don't know. I personally don't know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, the problem has gotten so big that, you know, it, 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 we're almost out of solutions. Any feasible solution? I, I think part of part of not a solution, but part of influencing at least change is awareness. And I think mm-hmm. Demolet is doing an amazing job at bringing some of these stories, some of these numbers, some of these specific conflict uh Related reporting into an audience that is very starved for it. So, Appreciate in that. that regard, that's that's amazing. Um, I want to invite you back later. Uh, specifically, I think this podcast is going to turn into a people want to know a little bit more about some of the stuff that's happening in Mexico. And we, if we have another Culiacanazo, mm-hmm. which I think we're probably going to have another one of those, if we have a, another Mormon massacre, that type of thing. Very want to very much want to invite you back to kind of comment and talk about some of these things directly. You know, more so not not so much as a guest, but actually to talk about some of these things in an open, honest conversation. That would be appreciate amazing. it. Thank you. Always happy to be here. Um, Demo there. Where can they find you? Yeah. Well, we just got taken off of Instagram for. Damn you, Instagram. <laughs> actually, one one facet that we were talking about the terrorist organizations you know one of the claims that they gave us when they took down one of our posts was that we were promoting terrorism so it's ironic that a a tech company is (laughs) it's enforcing policies but we have a backup account on instagram we're working on developing a website now where we can focus on a little bit long form reporting and we're also working on a podcast um, and this awesome. podcast will focus, you know, we believe in, in informing everybody from the origin. So this first season will focus on, you know, how we got to where we are, um, you know, the rise of opium, the rise of marijuana, um, some of the operations that have been launched, you know, in efforts of combating that and go deep dive. Um, and so they can find us on Instagram, uh, and a website, but we, we have all the links on the Instagram yeah, page. Yeah, we'll, sh- we'll share all that when we post this. Uh, Thank you. you are doing an amazing job. Demoler is an amazing uh, project, and you're risking a lot, and I appreciate that. I hope people that are that, that follow you can see that as well and, and hear that as well through this uh, podcast. Uh, thank you for coming on. Thank uh, you for having me. God bless Mexico. God save Mexico. You know. Um, thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank, Thank you. you.